Hello, and welcome to our fourth lecture in aerodynamics. Last time, we discussed how we go from distributed forces on an airfoil, like pressure and shear distributions, and how we translate them into body forces and moments about the cord. Today, we're going to be using these body forces and moments to explore non-dimensionalization, where we take dimensional quantities and normalize them by relevant parameters to make them more meaningful. This will naturally extend into a discussion about similarity, where we use some of these non-dimensional numbers while scaling a flow situation to ensure that both scales can be accurately compared. So let's jump right in. This video is all about dimensional dependence, and specifically, how we remove it. It's a technique that is widely used in fluid mechanics, and we make good use of it in aerodynamics as well. I think it's best to first see it used in an example before trying to describe it, but not necessarily a fluid example. Consider a travel distance of 5 kilometers. Some of you may have run a 5k in the past, so you're rather acquainted with this distance. Others, like me, might not know exactly how far it is, but know it's not terribly far. Instead of thinking of the distance exactly, you think of it relative to other things. You might think of how many hours it takes to walk it, or how much of your day it eats up, or if it would be too physically taxing. What you're doing when you think like this is non-dimensionalizing, or you're thinking relatively about the problem. And naturally, you make the assumption that it's you, most likely a human, traveling the distance. However, the distance is different for everyone who considers it. While a human might think that it's not too long of a distance, a whale, who typically travels great distances in migration, might think it's rather easy. However, if we zoom in on an ant and propose a 5k, they probably won't be happy about it. So, when considering the distance for these three organisms, we naturally non-dimensionalize and think of the problem relative to something important to that animal, like their body length. Here, let's designate a non-dimensional distance as d star sub 1, which is the travel distance divided by the body length. Instead of thinking of 5k as a raw distance, we think of it in terms of how many body lengths we've gone. For an average human, this is something like 3,100 body lengths, but only 167 whale body lengths. Conversely, an ant would have to cover its body length over 6 million times to go that distance. In this case, it seems like body length was the natural relevant parameter, and it nicely represents how difficult a 5k would be for each animal. However, Depending on the problem specifics, there are other ways to non-dimensionalize. Take the same distance, but we are now considering it for a human on a bike, in a car, and on a small-sized aircraft. Generally, this distance feels very different for each vehicle. However, the body length of the vehicle doesn't do it justice. A bike is not so different in length from a car, and a car is not so different from a Cessna. Certainly, not as big as the difference between a whale and an ant. In this case, we might have to be a bit more clever with our relevant parameter. Let's say we make a length scale that is not from a length directly, but from a velocity multiplied by a time. If we multiply the average velocity of each vehicle by a time interval that we feel is relevant, something like an hour or a day, we would get the length that each vehicle traveled in that set amount of time. Let's try this as our relevant length scale. d2 star is the distance 5k divided by this new length scale, which is the product of velocity and time. For the bike, this number is 0.21, for the car it's 0.07, and for the plane it's 0.017. Each case is almost an order of magnitude different for each, and more importantly it feels like it better represents how these vehicles interact with this distance. So, in fluid mechanics and aerodynamics, we do this all the time with our own problems and have to find our own relevant scales to normalize by. We seek out how to non-dimensionalize dimensional quantities so that they become more meaningful and easier to interpret. For example, let's consider two-dimensional quantities and their non-dimensional counterpart. First, we have the lift force, 
If we divide this by a relevant scaling, which we'll discuss later in this video, we get the lift coefficient, something we'll see all throughout aerodynamics. Next, we have the flow viscosity. If we normalize the flow viscosity by something else in the flow, like its inertia, we get the Reynolds number, which specifically tells us how important viscosity is in that given flow situation. Now, let's more formally introduce the lift, drag, and moment coefficients, which are the most prominent non-dimensional numbers in aerodynamics. The lift and drag are forces, and the moment is force-based, so it stands to reason that we will need a relevant reference force to normalize these dimensional quantities. In aerodynamics, we almost always have a surrounding flow field at a certain speed, and this flow has an inertia force. So, if we normalize by this inertia force, we can see how quantities like lift and drag compare to the total inertia force of the air itself. There are a number of ways to arrive to the expression for inertia force of air, but I like to think of it by starting with kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is a force times the length, and is also the mass times the square of the velocity. For convenience, let's turn mass into density times volume, and then turn volume into the cube of some length scale. If we isolate the first equation to get force, we can solve for a force in terms of mass and velocity squared. What we get is that the force of inertia is half of the flow density times some reference area and some velocity squared. The reference area can vary depending on your problem, but it's typically the planform area of a wing or the cross-sectional area of something like a cylinder. And our reference velocity also depends on the situation, but typically it is our free stream velocity, u infinity. Now, let's use this force of inertia term as our reference for the lift, drag, and moments. First, we have the lift coefficient, which is the lift force divided by this inertial reference. Done out and solving for lift, we get the lift equation, which is most commonly seen in this form. Interestingly, this equation tells us that the lift force will increase with the velocity squared, so it increases much more rapidly with increases in velocity than it will by increasing the cord length or wingspan by the same percentage. This is a powerful thing to know for an aircraft designer. We can also write out the per unit span equivalent, where we divide out by the foil span for both forces. Now, let's give a similar treatment to the drag force. What we end up with is a nearly identical equation called the drag equation, and it depends on all of the same parameters as lift does, but only has a different coefficient. And we can do it out for our drag per unit span. Lastly, we have the moment coefficient. This is slightly different because moment is force times distance. So we need to consider our inertial reference force and an additional length scale reference. Because the moment is usually due to forces on the cord line, some distance along the cord away from the moment location, it makes sense we use the cord as our reference. And if we do it out, we get the moment equation, which is the same as the drag and lift equations with the additional cord in there. And for completeness, we will also write out the moment per unit span. They may seem simple, but these coefficients are extremely powerful in aerodynamics. They mostly depend on an object's shape and should apply to the same shaped object of any size. Historically, these coefficients came about in seemingly two separate ways. For aerodynamics, they were introduced gradually and landed in their final form by the Wright brothers, whose family name is synonymous with aerodynamics. However, in fluid mechanics, we have a similar non-dimensional number and it's called the Euler number, which compares the force due to pressure difference to the inertial force. Now, it may seem like we've only taken dimensions out of our problem, but what we've done is a bit more useful than that. What we've done is make a similarity variable out of these quantities. In aerodynamics, similarity variables are non-dimensional numbers that must be held constant when scaling a problem. This ensures that when you scale a problem from one size to another, you can still compare those two scales accurately. Consider a wing in a wind tunnel. Our aim is to recreate its behavior in flight. 
but we have to do that at a different size foil and a different velocity due to our facility limitations. Both foils have different chords and different free stream velocities, but the same shape, in this case a NACA 2412. Now, what we would do is go to a book, look up the performance charts for this foil, and get its lift coefficient. Remarkably, that should be the same for both of these cases, despite the differences. So one coefficient is generalized for a whole range of object sizes because it was pr properly non-dimensionalized. In practice, we would measure the lift on the scaled down case, use that to calculate a lift coefficient, and then apply that lift coefficient to the flight size and predict the lift the wing would produce in flight at a much bigger scale. But there's no need to test different chord lengths, spans, or velocities because we know approximately how they will impact the lift forces. Outside of the coefficients, of primary concern are the Reynolds number and the Mach number as similarity variables. The Reynolds number is a famous comparison of the inertial force of the flow to the viscous force of the flow. In a sense, it's comparing how much forward momentum it has, or how resistant it is to change, and the viscous force represents one of the main mechanisms to try to change the flow's momentum. We use this number to tell us how relevant viscosity is to our specific problem. Let's crudely derive the Reynolds number. It is an inertial force divided by a viscous force. We already know what our inertial force is going to be. It's been used a lot in this video. Viscous force we know from fluid mechanics is a shear stress acting on an area, and shear stress is the fluid viscosity multiplied by the velocity gradient in space. Let's take this velocity gradient and simply call it a velocity scale divided by a length scale. In the end, we get that the viscous force reference is the viscosity times the length times the velocity. If we plug this back into the Reynolds number equation, we get that it's a product of the fluid density, speed, and length scale, all divided by the viscosity. Here, a common point of confusion is how we decide on the velocity scale and the length scale. And unfortunately, there's no one answer. It's very problem dependent. For flow over an airfoil, it's the foil cord and the flow speed. For flow over a cylinder, it's the diameter of the cylinder and the flow speed. For a propeller, it gets a bit trickier. Sometimes it's the diameter again, but instead now we use the blade tip velocity instead of the free stream velocity, which is a product of the rotational speed and the radius. So, care must be taken in choosing the relevant length scale and velocity scale for a problem. When we scale up or down in aerodynamic situation, and we preserve the Reynolds number, we are doing a number of things. First, we are ensuring that this flow has the same relative pressure and viscous drag approximately. Second, we are likely ensuring that we have the same flow separation characteristics. When and where a flow separates is generally a function of the fluid viscous forces, and thus the Reynolds number. And finally, we approximately ensure we are in the same laminar or turbulent flow regimes which are defined in terms of the Reynolds number. Outside of the Reynolds number, we have the flow Mach number. This non-dimensional parameter compares the inertial force to the compressive force of the fluid. When gas is decompressed or compressed, it takes a force, and the Mach number compares this force to the flow momentum. We start the same way as we did with the Reynolds number, but, for reasons you'll see soon, the Mach number is the square root of the force ratio. The inertial force is the same, again, density times length squared and velocity squared. The compression force typically scales as the product of the fluid bulk modulus and the area, by definition. The bulk modulus itself is a comparison of a change in pressure of a fluid to the percent change in volume. If we assume the blob being compressed isn't changing mass, we can trade out the percent change in volume for percent change in density. Now, we can't go into it in this video, but change in pressure divided by change in density is the speed of sound of a fluid squared, which we'll call A, but sometimes is C. 
If we plug all this back into the Mach equation, we simply find that the Mach number is the flow velocity divided by the speed of sound. As the flow approaches the speed of sound, the forces of compressibility are much more important. By preserving the Mach number when scaling, we ensure that the relevant impact of flow compressive forces are the same. Specifically, we'll use Mach number to tell when a flow is truly incompressible, and we don't have to consider the compression terms in the equations. Also, and more importantly, we make sure we are in the same sonic flow regime, which are divided into subsonic, transonic, supersonic, and hypersonic. If we're below Mach 0.8, we have subsonic flow. Once we clear Mach 1.2, we're sufficiently out of the transonic flow regime, and we've entered supersonic flow, where we see clear shock waves and expansion fans. And if we can get to high enough speeds, like something like Mach 5 or above, the regime is now hypersonic, where flow boundaries get incredibly hot and the properties of the grass break down chemically. You can imagine that if you scaled down a problem and your scaled down version is in a different flow regime than your scaled up version, you'll get very different flow behaviors. Essentially, you don't want to see shock waves in your experiment if you don't have shock waves in real life. Now, I'd like to end the video on a practical note. Matching the Reynolds number and Mach number can be fairly difficult for an experimentalist. Take, for example, a wind tunnel experiment where we are trying to measure flow over an airfoil that represents the wing of a commercial aircraft scaled down. Our goal is to get as close as possible to the flight Reynolds number while remaining incompressible so that density changes don't plague our results. The Reynolds number in flight can reach 10 to the 7. For our size foil and the fluid properties of air, we would need to run the tunnel at 200 meters per second to approach this Reynolds number. However, if we did that, we would be at Mach 0.6, which is sufficient to stay subsonic, but far from being considered truly incompressible. Our only options are to either make the foil bigger and increase the cord, but this requires a bigger facility and a lot more money. Otherwise, we could try to change our fluid properties and move to something like water, but this rarely helps because it's much harder to make water move fast than it is to make air move fast. Or we can do what is normally done, which is to get as high of a Reynolds number as we can and try to assess how being at a different Reynolds number may impact our results. So now you get a sense for how, in application, the similarity variables are wrestled with. Let's review. First, we use a simple non-fluids example to motivate thinking relatively and using non-dimensional numbers. We define that the flow lift, drag, and moment coefficients by comparing them to a reference force related to the fluid inertia. Then, we considered how we would use these non-dimensional numbers when scaling problems up or down, ensuring that the cases follow similarity. The two primary similarity variables in aerodynamics are the Reynolds number and the Mach number, which are often at odds with one another in application. And that's it for today. Thanks for sticking around, and I hope you enjoyed it. See you next time.